Okay. So actually, it's more uh, a recommendation. <laughs> okay. You know that at the end of the course, uh, there's this uh, questionnaire to fill in that is uh, named JCT in English, that means a Joint Committee on Teaching. That's the official translation, which is not that good, but if you are Italian, you know that it's called C CPD, uh, Comitato Paritetico della Didattica. Okay, that's a usual questionnaire that you have at the end of the course. You already filled in, uh, uh, filled it in in uh, the first semester. Okay, so I invite you to to fill it in, and especially the free comments. Free comments uh, only goes to me. They are anonymous, of course, all, as all the rest of the questionnaire. So you can write whatever you want, and you can uh, answer whatever you want. Okay, hopefully with something that is useful for the course with the, uh, you know, uh, good things, but also bad things or things that can be improved, okay? I know this is the first year for you because it's the first year that we are uh, uh, delivering this course uh, in, in the uh, cybersecurity course of study, so we don't have any feedback from previous years, but your feedback will be very useful for your colleagues next year, as it is for all the other courses. Uh, uh, you know, at the Polytechnic, all, all of the courses have this uh, opportunity, okay? So please do it. I think you have time to do it until uh, uh, mid-June, uh, so when the course uh, finishes, more or less, okay? Uh, it's not mandatory to fill it in. I'm also in a part of the CPD committee. I, I don't want to say unfortunately because it's a nice experience, but I mean, it's also something where you should work <laughs> additionally. And uh, it's not mandatory. It may, it's uh, the mandatory element is just that you have to do at least one click before booking for the exam. Uh, the, that means uh, there's a button where you can say, I don't want to answer to this question, and that's all, okay? Uh, and maybe you can also fill in uh, why that would be very useful for the CPD committee, okay, or the JCT committee to understand why it's not useful for you and why you think it's not useful and to improve for next years, okay? You know that this year has a lot of things has changed. Uh, the form of the questionnaire has changed. Uh, that's a common part for all the courses in the semester and uh, a specific part for each one of the courses, okay? So I think uh, this is useful also for those who, who uh, attend the course, let's say, online by watching at the um, recordings, okay? Uh, if you are enrolled in the course, uh, in any form, you can, you can fill it in, okay? Um, okay, so please uh, do it. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't take that much time. I mean, like uh, uh, fi five minutes probably, that's enough. Okay, and of course, you would, if you want, would like to spend more time, uh, you know, in the free form answers and give feedback to the teacher, that means basically to me, you're very, very welcome. Of course, you can speak to me as well if you don't w want to write, but in that case, you lose the an uh, anonymity features of the questionnaire, of course. Okay, okay, so that's the recommendation, initial recommendation. I will send a reminder. I mean, a few reminders on Telegram as well, okay? Unfortunately, this year, the, all, the whole system has changed, so I don't have the real-time uh, uh, percentage of, uh, um, you know, uh, of your answering. So it means I don't know how many of you have already answered. If you already answered, uh, thank you, uh, but you still have time, okay? So. Uh, we don't have this real-time feed that you used to have uh, uh, in the previous years because the the IT system has changed. Uh, but I hope uh, you know there will be quite a good number of answers. Okay. Okay. So we are resuming our class today, and this is the schedule for the the rest of the course. It's a a tentative schedule, but I hope there will be no changes, so we can. Uh, I mean, unless something uh, unexpected happens, this is the final schedule. And this is today, okay? So we, we will talk about authentication. We will finish that part. We will implement it as usual in the code uh, with an example. And then not tomorrow, but uh, the week after on Tuesday, you will try to implement it yourself in your exercise that you're carrying on in the lab, okay? 
On Thursday, we will have a lecture. And I mean, this is more the, the certain part. And the rest uh, may be subject to change. But uh, as I told you, unless there's really something uh, unexpected, I, I hope we stay with this schedule. OK? So we will talk briefly about uh, a final argument that is a topic that is uh, the deployment. But it's just for knowledge. This is not required for the exam. But we will also talk in details about the exam rules uh, and so on, and uh, you know, do any final consideration of the theory part if needed. Okay? And then you still have uh, uh, one lab that is implementing what I'm uh, uh, teaching you today. No lecture on the Thursday, the 6th of June. And then the text for the final exam will come out, okay? because you need to have uh, three weeks. Uh, until the deadline, which is uh, more or less the end of uh, the, the, the month, or so end of June. I think the, 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 the date of the exam is July 1st. Okay? But there will be more details, and we have a, a three hours lecture just for this. So I will explain everything to you uh, in, in this lecture. And of course, we will record it as well. And then, no activity on Monday. You will have the last lab on Tuesday, okay, with me as well. Okay? Uh, tomorrow and uh, the week after is uh, split between me and, uh, and my colleague because we have a, a commitment at the university meeting and stuff that we cannot avoid. And then we will spend the very last lecture of the course uh, in a lecture, um, just trying to design an actual solution for a sample exam. Okay, so we take a, an exam that I will publish uh, um, on the website. Uh, uh, you know, a few days before this lecture, you will have time to, you know, read the text, uh, think about it, and we will try to design the m most important things that are needed to solve this uh, sample exam. Okay, and uh, I will provide a full solution for this uh, whole uh, for this uh, sample exam. Of course, in three hours, we don't have time to implement everything from scratch. Okay, so I will provide a full solution developed according to what we decided to do during the lectures. And during the lecture, the most important thing we need to decide is how to, you know, design uh, APIs, uh, routes in the client, uh, and uh, components, more or less, you know, the structure of the component and the states in React. Okay? And once you decided those points, more or less, the rest is implementation. So you just take from the examples, you adapt to your case, and you, uh, you, know, you finish the work, you debug, and, and more or less, you're done. Okay? I, I don't want to say it's simple, but uh, I mean, if you start from a good design, things should be simpler, much simpler. Okay? Um, okay, so why are we are doing this? Because uh, the example that we are carrying on uh, during the lectures is quite simple, okay? It's uh, quite basic functionalities because we need to fit into three hours with the theory part and the, you know, the development. Um, and uh, we cannot really handle a big, uh, uh, um, I mean, a large request, a lot of requests from, 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 from a specification. Okay. Uh, while uh, here we will have uh, an actual exam, I think uh, it was given a, a few couple of years ago. Okay, in another course, of course, this is uh, the first edition of this course. But I will adapt it and make it similar to what we you will find uh, in this course, uh, and uh, we will try to handle it. Okay, so it will be very interactive. So please attend in person. That's the best thing. Of course, I record everything, so. No problem if you cannot attend, but of course, to pose questions, you need to attend in person. Okay? So, if you don't, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, today we're going to talk about the authentication. Right? So we already started talking about authentication, and uh, we will finish this part and try to. Uh, to uh, discuss, uh, I mean, implement uh, what we discussed. Okay? So authentication, we already said uh, there's a difference with authorization and on Thursday, so in three days, we will talk uh, more about authorization. But today we are talking about authentication and authentication means uh, basically giving uh, memory to HTTP because HTTP is stateless, cannot keep information on the server side unless we establish a session. Okay? 
a session is basically a, a, a way to um, keep the state of the application on, in one of the parties, and typically that's the server, okay? Uh, and this is done by means of a session ID, so a secret value that cannot be guessed easily, uh, that is stored on the client side and sent uh, to the server, and this is typically done uh, yeah, in the uh, HTTP world uh, with the cookie header, okay? And you know that what cookies are, you should uh, uh, have discussed them already in network uh, uh, networking courses uh, when you talked about HTTP, but in any case, it's a, an, a special HTTP header, and, the, the, and it's special also for the browser because the browser always sends this information automatically to the server uh, if uh, 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 there's a cookie set for that server. And by server we mean domain plus the path, okay? Slash if it's the root path or any sub path that you can uh, have and where the cookie was set, okay? Uh, we discussed about the cookie and we were more or less here, right? So uh, this is just a, a recap of what's happening in HTTP when uh, uh, um, you would like to authenticate, okay? So there are different interactions and the authentication helps you to establish uh, a state on the server that is connected to the session that you are using to communicate with the server from the client. So, let's say you initiate a, a, an HTTP request from the browser with a POST method, with a POST method because the POST changes the state on the server. This is really the typical case where the state of the server changes. You are creating a state, okay? so. You will never send a, a, a login request with a get, okay? That's a post, it creates a something. And typically you, f you supply credentials. And credentials, the most common credentials are username plus a password, okay? They ask you the your username, maybe your email, whatever the, the, the website defines as username and a password, okay? Typically your bank doesn't uh, define a username with, a, with an email, but with an internal number, more or less random, that gives it to you, okay? And then a password, a secret uh, string that you send to the server. The server checks what's, uh, uh, what's the content of username and password, and if this uh, corresponds to a user, if they correspond to a user, basically it creates a session, it saves some session data, Okay, so it creates the session ID, and plus it can attach uh, some information to the session. Uh, for instance, extracted from the database, like uh, your name, first name, last name, date of birth, uh, uh, and uh, you know, account number if it's a bank, or email address if it's uh, Google uh, email, and so on. And then it replies uh, with uh, a session ID, okay, in the form of a cookie. That's a response, HTTP response. That will have a particular header that is set the cookie that, ha uh, that says to the browser to store this cookie coming from this server, okay? And the content of the cookie will be this session ID that has been just created by the server. And then, and then the rest happens. You interact with the server, and interacting with this server, you ask and you do all the operations uh, that you would like to do. With the bank, you check your balance. With the polytechnic, you check your exams, the list of exams, the list uh, for which you, of exams uh, for which you already have a mark, the list of exams you passed, uh, other activities, and so on. Okay, whatever you want. And in all these requests, there can be any, get, post, put, delete, depending on what you need to do. Uh, you will always send the cookie, so the session ID value. Actually, it's not you, it's the browser. The browser automatically does it for you if you did it in the form of a cookie. So if you store the session ID in the form of a cookie, okay? The server checks if this cookie header is present. If it's present, it checks the value, it searches in its uh, uh, 
um, storage if this uh, session ID is a valid value, so it means it's an active session with some information associated to, to the session ID. If it's true, uh, it retrieves the session data, it executes what, uh, what is requested by the request and gives a response. Okay? That depends on the request. If you ask for a list, it gives you a list. If you ask for creating a new uh, element, it will create the element and so on. Okay? It works as uh, it's required to do. If the session ID is not valid, it doesn't correspond to a, an active uh, session, it simply says uh, the request is not authorized. So there will be uh, an error message or something like uh, this in, in the response, and nothing is done on the server side. Okay, so the server just checks if the session ID is valid, it means it's you. You in the, in the sense that it's the one that authenticated before in the previous tra HTTP transaction. Otherwise, just doesn't recognize anybody and it, cannot, it, it will not do anything, okay? Okay, um, so that's uh, more or less the basic scheme that we will need to implement uh, today, okay? Um, okay, some security tips. Always use HTTPS. That's uh, <laughs> that's the first security tip that actually we are not going to follow. But just for this course and just for our simplicity, for configuration simplicity. Okay, I know this is a, the cybersecurity course of study. I'm, uh, it's really unfortunate that we have to, you know, deviate from this uh, good programming pattern, but uh, this simplifies a lot of things uh, for us uh, during the development and during the testing, okay? I will show you the HTTPS when we do a small deploy, okay, an actual deploy on a, on a server somewhere in the, in, in the network, in the cloud, okay? But, I mean, we cannot use it for the exam or for our development because it's too complex. Complex means uh, for HTTPS you need to set up a certificate and the certificate uh, either is self-signed, so it's basically useless and it creates a lot of warnings and so on in the browser, or you need to pay somebody to provide you a certificate, but you need to have a public server and the public server is not nice because you, you put uh, uh, development code there and you don't want anybody accessing this server uh, from wherever place around the world and so on, okay? So there are many reasons why we cannot uh, really adopt uh, this strategy while developing, okay? Um, okay, so uh, uh, it, it would be nice to use HTTPS and the secure option in cookies, at least in production. Well, in production you should use uh, for sure, okay? Nowadays, if you develop a website and it's not over HTTPS, many people would would probably think, um, I mean, is this site a legitimate? Uh, it's a good site and so on. So, I mean, uh, it's more or less mandatory, <laughs> okay? And also use the HTTP only option in cookies. This is much simpler. We will set it. Actually, uh, good uh, frameworks will always set it. So, I mean, this is no problem uh, and we will use it. And this is an application requirement. Never, never store sensitive information in cookies. But if we stick to the programming pattern that we just uh, saw uh, before, so it means uh, um, there's a session ID that is generated from the server. I mean, that's no problem. The server knows how to generate this session ID, and it's basically a random, big random number, okay? So this is easy to follow. Just, you know, avoiding to create your your own cookies, put information there, especially in clear text, uh, that can be read by the, the user, okay? If you have a look at what's happening, okay, in a, an actual website, let's have a look. Okay, this is GitHub where I put the slides. Let's have a look at the storage. You see there's a cookies, GitHub, there's a plenty of cookies, but I cannot assume nothing really special, nothing no, no information from these values. You see, they are basically random strings, okay? So you shouldn't see that, well, that's a record and the password is. Of course, that's a possible cookie, but no, it's not really a good security practice, right? Okay? Yeah, um, okay. Uh, did I start recording? Yes, yeah, everything is working. Okay, okay. So second big advice, 
rely on best practice and well, in Italian uh, we say avoid to reinvent the wheel, I hope in English it's the same, okay? For authentication and authorization, okay? Because there are many, many, many things that can go wrong, okay? I know you are uh, following, attending the cybersecurity course of study, so you might feel that, well, I know how to do things. Well, actually, uh, w uh, you will know how to do things, not even at the end of the course, but probably with a lot of years of experience in the industry and probably working with others. Uh, no standard is, de is developed by a single person, okay? There's a lot of person, typically experts with a lot of experience in this field that, uh, you know, discuss and contribute to create uh, specification for standards and so on. So it's not like, uh, okay, I attended this class and I'm an expert in, s in security and now I will design my authentication system, okay? Just try to rely on this uh, uh, best practice, uh, uh, the, the, the best practice that we will see. And of course, we will not cover all the possible cases. So, you know, for more advanced cases, you will have to study and, you know, search for, for a good standard that covers your case and uh, understand it and implement it well in, in your applications. Okay? We will cover basic uh, stuff, but uh, uh, we will try to do it uh, in the best possible way. You know, you already know that. Uh, a web application can be exposed to a lot of attacks. Uh, Cross-site scripting is something very common, uh, where the attackers inject malicious J JavaScript code into web pages, and that's why we would only use HTTP-only cookies in uh, the browser. Because regardless of what's happening in the JavaScript, including our JavaScript, not only in the malicious code, but in our JavaScript, nothing can go wrong in this sense because the browser does not allow any JavaScript code to access the cookie, okay? The cookie value. You can, you have uh, uh, functions in JavaScript. We didn't see them because we actually don't use them. But you can go uh, in document, so in the, uh, in the browser object model, window, document, and so on, or window, I don't remember, and you, can, you have a, a field that is called cookie, and there you can access cookies, but not the HTTP-only cookies, okay? This is because, uh, you know, uh, in the old days, uh, many thought, uh, you know, accessing cookie could, could be a, 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 a nice uh, option for, for JavaScript because you can do a lot of things, but uh, uh, not, not now, okay? Not now for authentication, at least. For storing, let's say, a preference, like I would like to have the light or dark theme and stuff like that, that's fine. Okay, but that's not the sensitive information and so on. That's why you have this possibility to interact with the local cookies. But, uh, you know, for authentication cookies and things which are sensitive, you should never allow JavaScript to access uh, these values. And then there's this uh, CRSF attack. We didn't see it yet. We will address it uh, later in this course, uh, po possibly on, um, on Thursday, so in three days, otherwise on uh, the, the last lecture where basically users are tricked by an attacker to submit a request they did not intend. They send you a link by email or put a link in some uh, um, uh, forums or whatever, which is a malicious link. You click it, you have uh, the authenticated session, and you perform an action you didn't want, okay? Like you check your balance uh, or in the bank or you send some request of, you know, whatever, whatever you did not intend to do. Okay, but since the cookie is sent automatically, okay, even if the malicious code and the link cannot access the cookie, the browser sends the cookie, that's the problem, okay? And we will uh, discuss, uh, you know, the problem and how to address, um, I, I would say mitigate the problem at least, okay? But in, in general, the message is proper usage of frameworks, best practices, dedicated libraries help in preventing many attacks. Most of the attacks, I would say, okay? Most of the problems comes uh, out because, uh, um, you know, developers didn't follow the best practices for many reasons, uh, you know, time pressure, you, we, they didn't have time. I mean, it's not just your exam. Even when you go outside and, you know, work for companies, uh, they say, this should be ready for tomorrow, uh, and you don't have time to, you know, study all the things and implement all the things that you should do. Maybe you think, well, I'll fix it later, and then you forget, and so on. So, I mean, the, the point is that frameworks are typically good in doing the things, uh, and, and the fact that you should follow their pattern, 
okay, as much as possible. Of course, uh, uh, it's not always easy, but there are a lot of uh, advices and checklists uh, that you can consult. For instance, the OWASP website is very useful in this uh, regard. So you, you see a lot of things, uh, okay, do not do this, uh, password length, uh, uh, secure password recovery, there are many things that you should uh, you know, handle in an actual application. We will not handle all of these things, okay? But we will try to point out important things when needed, okay? Then you can have this as a reading. Okay, so let's see how to do these things in practice. So actually, first, we need to you know, uh, implement the basic login flow. And uh, basic login flow means uh, there's a form with uh, two fields, username and password, and with a button, login, okay? Or cancel if you would like to go back, but that's, that's just navigation, okay? And so, basically, the user fills out a form with a unique user identifier and a password, okay? Something secret. The data is sent to the server, it's, it's validated by the server. Well, no, sorry, it's validated on the client. It means that just that, uh, you, I mean, we don't want to send a request with an empty password. Of course, it will be refused. I mean, uh, the password is empty. We didn't provide a password, okay? This basic form of validation is done on the client. And then if it's okay, it's sent to the server with the post API, as we said, okay? We are creating a, se a session an information, a place where to store information on the server. So that's a post, session, a post request. The server receives the request, checks whether the user is already registered and if the password matches the stored one. So the user should be already in the system. It means this username and this password should already be known to the server, okay? Um, we will not cover the registration part in this course again, maybe might be requested in some exams, but typically we don't request this part because it's very mechanical. You follow the guidelines, you implement things as required, and you implement the registration part. So that's no point in, you know, in trying to discuss this part. Uh, you take it, uh, you, you implement it once, and then it's always the same for all the places, okay? Okay, password comparison. We will we'll discuss uh, uh, this uh, later in a few slides. If you determine that username and password are not valid, for whatever reason, username does not exist, the password is not the same as the one that we stored uh, before, and so on, uh, the account has been disabled for some reason, and the user is no more active, whatever you want, you send back a response to the client saying, you're not al allowed to authenticate, or with a a more use, user-friendly message is wrong username or password, okay? And note that you shouldn't write details about what's happening, okay? That's a basic security principle in general. Just provide the minimum amount of information required by the client uh, to understand what's happening, but not more, okay? It's not nice to say, uh, login failed, it's an invalid user ID because I'm telling you this user does not exist, okay? And if it's an email, you already know that this email is for a user that is not registered in that system, okay? And if they, they know that you answer like this, just throwing a random email in the login form, then they can try with an email that they know they exist, okay? And if they say in login for user X, Invalid password, okay, they already got uh, the name of the user from the email, okay? So this kind of answer should never be given to, to the requester. And remember, the request can be anybody. Anybody that can connect to the internet can send this request to your server, okay? Because typically the login form is accessible by anybody. It's a, the front page for, for doing authentication. So somebody in Australia, somebody in, uh, I don't know where in the world, can send requests to your page, okay? Can be anybody. Uh, and so you shouldn't, gi you shouldn't uh, give information to this anybody that you don't know, okay? Except for the fact that, well, there's something wrong. You cannot authenticate, okay? 
and it's your issue to determine what's wrong. Okay, it's not my task to tell you what's wrong. Okay, because I don't know what, who you are. Okay, so you 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 see that uh, for instance, there's a, a specific part in the OWASP. Okay, uh, the uh, intra page link doesn't work, but no, what you should uh, you know do or not do, what you sh should say or not say, okay, about uh, the answers, okay? The account does not exist. I don't like it, okay? And if you answer in this way at the exam, we will subtract a point from the mark, okay? But that's not difficult to implement. You just have to take the example that we give uh, during the lecture and use it as it is, without inventing anything, okay? We hope to have used the, the best practice, best possible practices, okay? So, okay, okay means uh, that's the correct uh, answer to give. Login failed, invalid user ID or password, okay? We don't give additional information uh, um, with respect to what we already said, that the transaction, HTTP transaction returned uh, uh, an error, okay? Okay, and then, if username and password are correct, the server needs to generate this uh, session ID, okay? And the server needs to remember this session ID because it will connect this session ID with the fact that a certain user has authenticated, at least with the username that uh, was provided in the, in, in the previous transaction, okay? And then typically the server also extracts additional information because after the user is authenticated, the server typically would like to do additional things, okay? Like know the first name, last name, uh, and all the details about uh, this user so they can operate uh, you know, with, with this information on the server side, okay? Um, so if everything goes fine, the server replies to the login HTTP request, or so the POST request, by creating and sending a cookie, okay? With a certain name. Each cookie has a name, okay? The name is the key. The cookie storage is a key value storage. So there's a, a key which you should know to recover the value, okay? It's like a, a JavaScript object in a certain sense. So you decide a certain name, can be a generic one, a session ID, session, session seed, session SID, my session ID, whatever you want, okay? Each framework typically has its own name, but I mean, we don't really care. The important thing is that we know it. And the value is the value of the generated session ID. And then there are two options to set, as we said, HTTP only true, and secure true if possible, okay? In our example, we will not do it because we don't use HTTPS, but in general, you should set it. What does secure means? It means that the, the browser will never send the cookie on an, uh, on an HTTP request which is, not, uh, uh, which is not passing over HTTPS, so uh, we, uh, whose uh, uh, connection is not encrypted, okay? Why? Because anybody reading this ID can take this ID and send requests to the server, and the server has no way to know if this request comes from an actual user who has authenticated correctly, or it's a, an attacker or uh, somebody that uh, would like to access uh, information he or she is not allowed to do, okay? So it should be kept secret, okay? So it means that when the value is in transit in the network, so it leaves your computer and it goes to the server, it should be encrypted, so it should not be readable by anybody who is looking at the network traffic, okay? And this uh, secure true basically says that if by mistake I've done something that sends the cookie over an HTTP connection, the browser should refuse to send the cookie over that HTTP connection. So basically it, does not, it doesn't leak this uh, cookie, so the session ID, to somebody who is potentially looking at the network traffic, okay? This should then happen in channel, but it's an additional protection. It just says to the browser, don't transmit the cookie if the connection is not encrypted, okay? And what, what will happen? Well, uh, the transaction will fail. The, the server will not see the cookie. It says you are not authorized, okay? But typically, in, in, if everything has been implemented correctly, this situation shouldn't happen, okay? 
because every request we will send should be over HTTPS, okay? At least in production, not in the examples now because of the reason I told you before. And then the browser receives the response with the cookie, and the cookie is automatically stored by the browser as it did it uh, already, I, I, I showed you, okay? When I log it in on, on uh, GitHub, okay? Uh, it's actually uh, showed me uh, the, the, the um, uh, actually stored the, the, the ID, okay? Actually, indeed, it's not a good idea I show you this ID in the, in the uh, and I leave it recorded in the lecture. I will log out and log in again <laughs> after the lecture, okay? But it's partial, right? Hopefully, <laughs> and you didn't see uh, uh, all the part of the session I did, okay? So, um, and the response body is handled by the application, and then the application does whatever uh, the, the, it wants to do, like, uh, you know, greet the user, welcome Enrico, this is your, your Polytechnic homepage, uh, it, this is your bank account, and so on, okay? And start working on it, okay? Uh, and the browser, we send it again every time we interact with the same domain and path, okay? As we said before. Okay, so how do we implement the form? Well, form is very easy. I mean, we, set, we, we are able to handle forms in React, right? So, I mean, it's a standard practice. Uh, we create a controlled form, two fields and two states, username and password, a submit uh, button, uh, prevent default. We don't want to reload the application, of course, as with any other form. If form valid, so it means we don't have a, an empty username and empty password. Maybe you can check if there's an email, if you're, uh, the user, I mean, the server requires an email for username, and that's all. And then you send the information to the server, and you wait for the answer from the server, okay? So nothing really sp special compared to another form where, you, for instance, you add an answer or you add a film in your uh, lab examples, okay? So it's normal controlled form uh, um, uh, component, okay? And then that's the server part. That's a more difficult one, okay? It will take quite a lot of coding. Part of the coding has already been prepared, okay? So we'll not spend too much time. And then you just have to use it, okay? Then don't invent anything. Uh, we suggest to use uh, this authentication middleware in Express, which is called the Passport, okay? Passport.js. Uh, we install it uh, with this name, Passport. It's very flexible and modular. Unfortunately, the documentation is not that good. Uh, so sometimes you need to search a little bit uh, uh, around and in the, uh, look into the code. But for very simple stuff, we will give you advice, okay? Of course, it provides a way to authenticate with very simple schemes like username and password, but it's very flexible and allows you to, you know, make uh, authentication work even with more complex systems. Like, you know that sometimes in the website you can say, well, log in with your GitHub identity, with your Google identity, Facebook identity, and so on, all this stuff, and this is supported as well. Of course, it's more complex. We will not cover it again, <laughs> but... Uh, uh, the point is that in that case, uh, in those more complex cases, you cannot just take the password. Google doesn't like that you share your password with a, with a third website, okay? And so there should be an exchange of information between the servers to, to make sure that you, that you use the correct Google password and Google authorize a certain website to use uh, their password on their website. I mean, not the password, but you as a user to work on that website and so on. So there should be a trust, uh, some trust between the servers, okay? Um, and then the good thing is adopt, it, uh, the, the passport adopts some best practices under the hood, that means uh, that in general the default configurations is quite good. For instance, it uses the HTTP only cookies. Okay, so the HTTP only option for the cookies for the sessions. So let's have a quick look on how things uh, should work and then we will uh, practice with the code, okay? Um, so for an example based server, that means basically our API server now, we should, we should configure it in three ways before we can use it, we can use Passport. 
Well, first choose and set up which authentication strategy to adopt. That's the easiest one. We will use username plus password. Password. Then personalize and install additional middleware. Again, easy, easy. NPM install something more if needed. And then the difficult part, decide and configure which user info is, do, is uh, linked with the specific action. Because this depends on the application the application you are developing. So there, there might be some common parts, but uh, uh, the rest should be decided depending on what application you are developing. OK, so point one, local strategy. That's the name of the strategy that uh, implements uh, authentication by username and password. OK, so npm install, i means install. OK, that's a shortcut uh, which works in npm. Uh, passport local. And it provides, a, you should provide actually a function verify username and password and the callback. And in this function, you should check by yourself if the username and password are uh, valid for your application. Okay? It's up to you. Uh, it's you that you are storing uh, this information somewhere, typically in the database. Okay? Because that's the most flexible part of the, uh, the server where you can store information. And the callback uh, will call called back from passport once uh, the user uh, uh, actually, um, no, sorry, your, your function should, should call this callback to tell passport that you finished the operations. And depending on how you call this callback, uh, you tell passport if the authentication has been successful or not. That's the next slide, OK? So this callback can be called in, uh, well, basically four different ways. Null and user credential were valid, and you have this user object that you can pass to passport, okay, to store uh, this information later in another place of passport. Or with false, it means uh, there was a problem during authentication. You can include an optional error message. Mm, nothing really special you could write here, as we as uh, we discussed before. You can only write uh, incorrect username and passport or pass password. Uh, you don't want to leak information again, OK? And then, OK, you can, uh, instead of null, you can give a, an object as first parameter if there's an application error, like uh, the database is not available. It's not that uh, your authentication failed. It's just that I'm not able to check uh, the username and password now, OK? Sometimes it might happen. In our very simple cases, of course, it never happens because, uh, I mean, the the, the the database is local, it's a file, so the, nothing that can really fail, okay? Unless you are developing and you, you have, have written a wrong query, okay? But, uh, I mean, in production, uh, it, it cannot fail. Uh, but in other cases where the database is an external server and so on, something might go wrong in, in the communication, okay? And the user is any object containing information about the currently validated user, and that's decided by us. That's a more difficult part. OK, OK, before going on, how to store passwords in the server. Never, never store plain text passwords in the server. It means in the database, actually not in the server. You, I, I hope you are not are coding password in the, in, the, in, the, in the server code, OK? But I'm talking about the database. Why? Because uh, you don't want that anybody who has access to the database can read uh, the database and say, well, OK, that's the user and recon, that's his password. Nice. Now I'm using it and, you know, to steal with something to, to get a good mark and, you know, on the Polytechnic website and so on. OK? Even if it's for, you know, legitimate reason, there will be database administrators that typically have access to the database. OK? There's nothing wrong for them. Uh, because they, they need to run the database and sometimes they need to check what's wrong, okay, if something doesn't work. But that exactly for this reason, you wouldn't want to store the password in clear text, okay? And so what is recommended by basically all best security practice is to store a password hash uh, and not an en encrypted password, okay? and hashed password. What's the difference between encryption and hashing? I hope you already have this concept. You should, I mean, my colleagues told me that you should have it. 
you know, from previous uh, courses. So an hash function is a one-way function. I take a string that is actually the password. I pass it to the hash function. I get another string, which cannot be understood anymore, okay, which is very different from the previous one. And I cannot go back. So if I give you the hash, I cannot go back to the original string that formed the, the hash, okay? Unless I really try all the possible options. I don't know the length of the password, so all possible options it will take, uh, you know, till the end of the world. Uh, <coughs> unless it's a very, really stupid password, that's, that's another problem. Again, we will talk about this uh, maybe uh, a bit later. Uh, while encryption is a two-way function, if I have the, the key, I can decrypt the password, okay? And that's not what I want, okay? So what do I do if the user loses the password? I cannot recover the password, right? And indeed, most of the good, uh, good designed websites, well-designed websites, what do they do? They give you a one-time link to use to reset your password. They don't give you your password back uh, in any form, SMS, email, whatever. If they do, I mean, just run away from those websites, okay? Because it means they store the password either in clear text or encrypted, which is not a good security practice because uh, if you have uh, the decryption key, and remember, the database administrator has the decryption key, otherwise, how can you authenticate people, uh, users, okay? so. We need to store the hash password. It means that only the user knows the password, okay? And if he loses or she loses the password, it will set another password, okay? We don't know the older one, okay? So first, hash the password. Don't encrypt, but hash the password. So a good hashing function is basically impossible to crack. Okay, the only thing you can do is guess passwords. That means, uh, for sure, he, he, this guy is not expert. He will, uh, he probably the password is one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, or something stupid like this, password, or PWD, as we will use just for simplicity, uh, or a very simple Q, W, E, R, T, Y, and so on, this, you know, very simple password, or very simple, uh, words, okay, names, uh, your friend's name, your, your, your girlfriend or boyfriend's name, and this kind of things, okay, very simple stuff. So, password can be guessed, and the hash does not prevent from, you know, trying to guess, because if I guess the password, I hash those, that guess, and I will get the same hash. Because the hash is one-way function, but it's also a deterministic function. Okay, so this, this should be clear. Okay, uh, so I hopefully should have users that set uh, a, a, a um, you know uh, a good passwords. Okay, uh, either I pray, but of course it's not a really good uh, strategy. Okay, or I enforce some. Uh, constraints uh, to try to make my user choose good password when they set the password, okay? That's why when you register on a website, they tell you uh, it should be at least 10 characters long, it should be at least one uppercase, one lowercase letter, it should be at least one special character, and all this kind of stuff, because they don't want you to use stupid passwords, okay? <laughs> Uh, they would like to make password difficult to guess, okay? No more than two consecutive uh, characters uh, that are the same and stuff like that, okay? Uh, there, there are probably guidelines about this. Again, you should check on reputable website like OWASP and so on. Probably they have a link to, to something like this, okay? Uh, but from our point of view, let's say that is, there's somebody that tries to guess passwords, okay? Uh, either trying to connect, but this is easily handled. I mean, if you have some, some monitoring system, you see, uh, you see a lot of failed login attempt, you can stop and ban, uh, 
you know, the request from that address or that, you know, place uh, for a while and so on, okay? But if the attacker gets his or her hands on, on the database, okay? So the database is leaked by, for some reasons, uh, with the ashes, what does uh, he or she do? She does, I mean, no, do. Sorry. Uh, well, it will try to crack. Crack means uh, try to, you know, perform hashing of passwords, guessing password and trying to hash, and check if the hash corresponds to some hashes in your leaked uh, database, okay? That's the, 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 what, what uh, you would do to, to try to guess some password. And once you guess a password, you can use it on the actual website because you have the username from the database and then the password, and you can authenticate and operate as the user, okay? So, uh, <coughs> you see, um, sometimes it happens, you know, that the, the database of big sites are compromised. That means leaked. They are sold uh, in, in the dark web and in these places, okay? Uh, the, the bigger is the, your website, uh, the, the more, uh, uh, let's say, the, the more uh, the, the you, you become a, 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 the more interesting is uh, uh, your website from the point of view of, of the attacker, okay? Because uh, if, if I break in into GitHub, there are millions of users, right? And sometimes they have a paid subscription and things I can take advantage of from and so on. If I break in in Google or in whatever big website, I can do a lot of things, okay? Uh, of course, they, they hopefully are well protected, but sometimes these things happen, okay? If you Google a little bit, you will see there are, you know, uh, occasions in which uh, millions, tens of millions of passwords have been leaked in this way, okay? Hopefully not in clear text, but hashed like this, okay? Because that's a minimum security practice you should implement, and indeed it's required for the exam. But it's also provided, I mean, you just have to copy and paste. Nothing, nothing really peculiar, okay, uh, that you need to invent. And also, uh, what's, what's uh, the problem of using a simple hash like this? Well, let's have a look. Uh, so, uh, this is the stolen database. There's a username, user123 and so on. Just, uh, it's a small one, of course, I need to fit it onto the slides, but you need to think this in terms of millions of users uh, or more. Uh, and this is the hash, okay? So you see that the user3 and user5 has the same hash. That means they use the same password, okay? And if you use a random password, this is very difficult uh, that happens. I mean, this doesn't happen often, okay? It's very, very un unusual, right? The, the longer is the password, the, the more unusual it is. Uh, so this is an indication first that user three and user five have the same password. And typically, if you have the same password as another one, typically it's not a good password, okay? <laughs> And so probably the attacker starts from this hash that sees, uh, that can see it's repeated here in the database, you know, for trying to crack the password, okay? And in this probably it's a weak password, so it will be successful in cracking passwords, okay? Nowadays there's a lot of computational power available. It doesn't take so much uh, to, you know, hash passwords, so you can, you know, hash uh, I don't want to say a number, but uh, in the order of millions a second, maybe. Okay, it depends on the algorithms and a, lo a lot of things. But uh, you know, cracking a million password means that you need to have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, like uh, uh, millions of billions of possible choices, you know, to avoid cracking in this way. Okay, and so indeed, uh, this is a very basic way of protecting password. You could do a step uh, more an additional step, and actually use a salt, okay? And actually this is always used uh, in, in good uh, um, systems. Because the technique is very, very simple, it doesn't uh, create additional complexity, 
uh, on the server side. So when you authenticate users, uh, that is your main uh, uh, goal. It doesn't create additional complexity, but it creates a lot of additional complexity for the attackers in case your database uh, is leaked. Uh, so it arrives uh, in the hands of the attacker. So it's a, what's a salt? It's a unique randomly generated string added to each password before the hashing process. So you concatenate the password coming from the user and the salt. The user doesn't know about the salt. The, the salt is stored in clear text in your database. Okay? So it's an operation that you do before computing the hash. Uh, it's generated when you create a new username and password record in the database. So when your user registers or creates a new password or changes the password, you can create a new salt. And uh, uh, this has the advantage that you, you force the attacker to run the hashing for each password and salt pair. Okay? Because you know, if the user has used the same password as another one, as, uh, I should concatenate uh, the password that I guess with the salt to get the hash to check if the password is correct or not. And so in this way also I don't know if two users have the same password. Me as a database administrator, but this not an important thing, but the attacker doesn't know. Okay? So always use salt when hashing password. And basically, most modern algorithms basically already include it uh, into the algorithm itself. It's so, and uh, in the in in the string that uh, gives uh, uh, as a result of the hash. So there's a part that is a salt, and the rest is uh, the hash. Okay. Um, so using the salt does not increase the complexity of the hashing process. It's just using a, a, a bit longer string uh, as an input for the hash. Okay, so we will ask you to use this approach and uh, we will provide the code as well. And uh, we will also keep the salt separate in database uh, just because this is, uh, you know, a first cybersecurity course on web applications. So, of course, we could use a function that does everything by itself, but we would like to draw attention on this uh, uh, aspect. Okay. So salt makes a cracking large number of hashes significantly more complex because that's the situation that we had before. Instead of, you know, hashing one password, candidate password, and try to check if the hash is the same, it tends to, you know, check the candidate password towards all the hashes using for each one of them the salt that has been used during the creation of the hash. Okay, so instead of hashing the candidate password just once and checking all the users, it needs to hash the candidate password as many times as there are users here in the database. So if it's a million, a million times, if there are 10 million, 10 million times, just for one single password. While before it could check, the attacker could, uh, you know, check 10 million passwords. Okay, now it just checked one password. Okay, because it has, it has to add the hash. Of course, this uh, salt is small, it's very small in this example, and to fit everything in the slide. So things should be a bit larger, larger like, uh, you know, 32 or 64 characters for ashes. Uh, we will give uh, advice on this, and the 16 characters for salt at minimum and something like this, okay? So that's very important to understand, okay? Um, okay. Um, so we will ask you, you know, to store password in this form. So you will see that in the user table, there will be username, of course, uh, the hash of the password, not the password in clear text, and the salt. Okay. Um, and that's the advice we give. As usual, we give advice on how to implement this stuff. Okay. So S script uh, is a reasonably secure uh, password hashing function. Uh, it's also nice because Okay, well, okay, <laughs> I hope it's not an attack. Well, um, it, it's, uh, it's nice because uh, there are online tools. Well, it's you know, not the only one, but uh, the, there are online tools uh, that can be used uh, to compute the hash. Uh, um, and also in Node, it's already available. Okay, you don't have to install anything. You just to require crypto, which is not to be installed. It's already there, okay? And, uh, but you need to handle the hash separately, which is good for us in the sense like that uh, I told you before. Okay? What's wrong here? No. Well. Uh, okay. So there's a, a password generator, it means uh, it computes the hash. Okay? 
So that's my hash, PWD, and salt, I write something, okay? I decide the output size, 64, well, let me make it a bit bigger, okay? And a script, and that's the hash, okay? The whole string. And from this string, I don't know which, which password I used. If I forget, nothing I can do. I can just do like the attacker, I can guess, okay? I, I, in this course, probably I used a weak password, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I can guess, but there's nothing I can do. I just change the hash if I don't remember the password, okay? Um, okay, uh, that's why when you submit your final project, but th there will be instruction on this, okay? But when you submit your final project, don't forget to include username and passwords in the readme file. Because we cannot open the database and look at the password. There's no password there. That's the hash. If you know the password, good. Otherwise, we cannot test the application. Okay? We need to change the hash. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the functions. Uh, you need to generate the salt. Oops. Okay? If you are implementing the user registration, you need to do it into the, in, the, in the code. Otherwise, you create uh, some random strings uh, by hand or, you know, in, in any way you like, okay? As I just did before here, okay? So I just uh, put a random string that's a salt, okay? And uh, I, I simply used it, okay? Okay. Um, Okay, and that's a way to, to check. So, in short, in the server, we will have a, a function that takes the, use, uh, the email and password, goes into the database, extract, uh, well, the email, assume the email is the username, okay? Otherwise, it's a username. It goes into the database, it extracts uh, the row corresponding to the user. Well, if there's no row, the problem is solved. There's no user. You sh we shouldn't say there's no user, remember? Incorrect username and password. But then, I mean, there's no problem, no password to check, okay? If there is a, a row, there will be the salt to extract and the password, okay, to check. And the password, this, this password, what's the password? No, the row password is the one that comes from the database. And the password is the one that comes from the request, okay? And we need to check if the row password that means the hashed password that we extracted from the database is the same as the hashed password that we compute from the password that comes from the user, okay? If the function says it's the same, okay, resolve user, otherwise false, it means uh, we cannot authenticate you, okay? But, I mean, there's nothing really peculiar, I just, you know, need to be a bit careful uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, this function takes an array of bytes or, or a string or stuff like that, and you just copy this code and you are safe. Safe it means uh, good code and uh, uh, safe in the sense that everything is ready for the exam, okay? And, and to be used as well, okay, in, in actual good code. Well, okay, so long discussion about the uh, first step which was a form, but also the server side, which is more difficult because you need to store the passport and we say the hash and so on, hash and salt, okay? Additional middlewares, uh, well, uh, well, there was a password local, okay, fine, for username and password, but also we need a session. Expert doesn't come with a session, but uh, luckily there's an expert session package that uh, does a very simple thing. It's, it creates and stores sessions into the, into the memory, okay? So uh, the, the, the server is a process. It's a program running on the server, okay? It has a memory, memory space where the, you put variables and stuff, okay? You can put uh, session IDs there as well, okay? This is not, again, a good security practice in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, well, actually, not really about security, it's more about uh, uh, inefficiency, okay? Because if something is in the memory, if you stop the server and restart the server, the memory is deleted, right? And also, it's, uh, for this reason, that's not a, the, it's not particularly optimized. Uh, the implementation is not really well optimized, okay? 
uh, because nobody uses it, okay? You should uh, store it in some places, like in the database and so on. But again, for our purpose, we don't want to, you know, create a, a complete web application and so on uh, that you can use in production in actual website with millions of users and so on. That's uh, really another topic, and you probably learn this uh, when you are outside of the university, when you work in a company and so on, you, you probably never do a, a project big like this uh, alone, okay? That will be colleagues and stuff like that, uh, that, that you, uh, uh, that, that maybe have more experience or uh, they, uh, they, they give you advice and you give advice to them and so on, you, you discuss uh, and do things like that. Okay, so uh, for our purpose, we need something. And so we stick with the simplest solution that is to store the session ID into the memory. And we know that in case we stop and restart the server, it means that all the active sessions will be lost, okay? But for us, it's fine, okay? Uh, but in a more, uh, let's say, uh, production-ready environment, you should uh, uh, actually uh, use a, a, a better uh, system to save uh, um, session IDs, okay? That's a configuration. It just requires a, a secret that you need to personalize just, uh, you know, for internal purposes, okay? We don't really know or need to know what it, this is used for, okay? So that's, that's a session, okay? And there are parameters, uh, okay, this is a, a secret. Uh, the manual page says uh, sign the session ID cookie, but uh, I mean, we don't really need to care. I mean, there's a way to create a session ID, okay? That is, uh, uh, guaranteed to be unique and that cannot be easily guessed because it's uh, more or less random and big, okay? And the store, uh, you don't need to specify it, it's a memory store. And then there are these two options, uh, okay, you just, you just use the code that we provided, okay? That is already on the GitHub, by the way. And then there's the session content that is most, uh, most interesting to us. So, um, uh, this uh, uh, this is depends on the application, so we need to decide what to store in the session content, okay? <coughs> and to store information in the session content, we need to implement two functions, basically. This serialize user and this serialize user, okay? And in short, in the serialize user, you pass uh, an object with all the information you would like to store, and in the deserialize, you basically get back this object and you have the opportunity to take something from this object, uh, go into the database, uh, load the information or whatever you would like to do and give it back to the function that receives uh, the request from the user, okay? So it means in the routes of the server, okay? Uh, so the minimum thing you should put into a session is a user ID. Okay, a unique user ID. Otherwise, you are not able to associate your session ID with the user ID. That's the typical, typical information you need, you know, to, uh, to understand what you, what you should uh, do in the database. You create a new element, who, uh, what's the owner of this element? You would like to retrieve uh, this, uh, uh, some elements. Is the user allowed to see these elements? Okay, so you need to have information about this user ID. Okay, you, have a, you can follow different approaches. You can store more information in the session, so in the, in the memory, that's one possible approach. Or you can store the minimum amount of information in the session, like uh, for instance, just a user ID. And every time you get a request, you have the session ID that the passport session will convert into a, your user ID, that is the information that is stored on the on the server, in the, in the session storage, it gives you this ID and you go into the database and you get all the information you need from the database. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages in the two cases. In one case, you just load the information at the creation of the session and then the information doesn't change. In the second case, you can load every time different information from the database. For instance, if the user has changed the first name or last name or the address or whatever that you stored into the session, 
in one case it's fixed and you need to update the session information. In the other case, every time the last version of the information is loaded. Okay, so it's up to you. I mean, uh, in these very simple examples that we will use in this course, there's not that much difference. Of course, if you are designing, again, a, a website with millions of users and, uh, having millions of sessions active at the same time and so on, you need to think carefully about this because every time you get a, an HTTP request, you, go, you need to go to the database. Can be, the database could be overloaded okay? of requests okay? or for the same information. Uh, but, I mean, in a very simple case, we just need to be aware of this trade-off, okay? Store information in the session, but it's up to us, developer, to update it when it's needed, or store information in the database and retrieve it from the database when it's needed, okay? Uh, there are both approaches, okay? The first one is store in the session, and the second one is store the minimum amount of information in the session, like the user ID, and then get it from the database. It's up to you. We will choose one, probably the second one. I think I used it in the example. Okay, and then login. Well, login is very easy. Once we have, uh, you know, um, uh, all, all these settings in place. We just call uh, the passport middleware to do the authentication. And it will call all the functions that we defined before to check username, password, and to store the session and so on. Everything is done automatically and basically we are done, okay? So authenticate local, and it does everything for us, okay? Uh, just be careful, it looks by default, huh? okay? The, the manual page says it looks for username and password fields in rack body, but if we are sending things in a JSON format, we have the JSON parser on the server, as we already have, because all the communication has been done in JSON, we send a request with the content type application JSON from the uh, client, and we just create an object with two fields, username and password. That's fine, okay? Everything will work. And indeed, uh, uh, yeah, it's not shown here, it's in the examples, in, in the code, okay? Uh, but, uh, you know, in the function that uh, sends uh, the API, the client API that sends the request to the server, okay? Um, Okay, and then, then once you are authenticated, you have a React application, remember that. And so, uh, typically, the um, API function that does the authentication returns information to you. First name, last name. Hello, Enrico. Okay, say something about this. Uh, the, the application can say something uh, like this. And uh, um, this information is typically stored by React as any other information coming from the server. It's a state. We create a state. Instead of creating a state with a list of films, we create a state with the information about the user, which is uh, uh, undefined or null if there's no user authenticated with the server, and what that contains the information about the user if we have a user that has been authenticated. And how do we fill up this, uh, this uh, state? Well, the API of the authentication, we return the information to us and we put it into the state, okay? And then we decide how to distribute this information inside our application, passing props via context, whatever you want, okay? It's a state like the others, okay? Um, okay. You have uh, more suggestions here, but I mean, really no, not important to, to, to go there to look at, at least now. And then when you, when you implemented the first uh, uh, authentication mechanism, you can go and see, you know, for better advice and so on, you know, to organize things in a better way and so on if in a bigger application. After the login, some routes in the server needs to be protected. This is, is very, very, very important because we are implementing authentication to prevent the user from accessing routes, means APIs in the server that requires authentication, right? So like accessing a route that gives a bank account uh, balance, okay, should be protected, right? Couldn't be accessed uh, by an, uh, a user who is not authenticated. By the way, it's also 
useless in the sense that if I don't know the user, what should I do? I mean, who, what balance should I give? I don't have an account number associated with the user, okay? But in any case, even if there's a user authenticator, I should give the user only the information he or she should be able to access, okay? If I'm authenticated as Enric with the bank, with the bank website, I should see my balance, not your balance, okay? So in some ways, there should be a check that there's, there's a user which has an active session uh, that makes a request, and then who is that user? And then on the basis of who is that user, I need to go and retrieve the information, send it back to the requester, okay? Uh, so uh, the, the workflow is actually the same. It's the second part of the workflow we saw in the beginning, get exams, okay, the list of your exams. You are able to access your exams and your colleague, uh, his, her exams, okay? Uh, and we will talk about this uh, uh, when, it, when it's needed. This is a very important uh, point. Uh, remember that uh, this should work with course. Okay, remember course? We are doing a request from localhost 5173 to localhost 3001. Okay, so a different uh, website, a different API server. So the configuration we had uh, doesn't work anymore. Why? Because we need to include the cookie, which is a critical uh, element, okay? It's because the session is authenticated and course, I would say luckily, does not allow us to send cookies to places where they say origin asterisk. So any origin, because any origin means typically it's a public service, okay? It's a place where you shouldn't send cookies, could, could be anything, okay? So we need to modify the options in the server and say that the origin is our application, localhost 5173, and be, beware of this. If you run two client, uh, you should change, change it or close the first client and use the same port because if you are on 5174, it doesn't work, okay? Not like before, we had the asterisk, everything works. And then also put this option, credentials through. So it will, uh, the server will send back uh, in the pre request an additional header saying, okay, it's fine to send credentials to this place so you can send cookie. And the browser then will send the cookie, okay? If you set credential, of course, will not allow you to set asterisk here, okay? Luckily. But I mean the standard, not just the implementation. And when you do the request, guess, uh, again, you should include credential, including the fetch, in any fetch, including the login fetch, even though the cookie is not yet active, okay? That's, that's the way it's implemented in the browsers in the browser, okay? Uh, well, but I mean, this is very simple stuff. Uh, just, uh, you know, credentials include on the client and configure course on the server in a correct way, that's all. And protecting the server APIs, yeah, we are more or less done. Then we will break for, 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 for a few minutes. Protecting server APIs, well, uh, yeah, we should have uh, uh, a function in the code for each API that checks if the request is authenticated. Rec dot is authenticated, it's something made available by Passport, okay, once we use Passport for the authentication with sessions. So in each request, there will be this method, okay, that will return true if there's a valid session associated with this request, so the cookie came and it matches a session ID that is valid now, or it just returns false, so you need to decide what to do when, when it's false. I mean, just say, no, you're not allowed to access uh, uh, content and that's all, okay? To be done at the beginning of very callback body in each API that needs protection. Remember that there can be APIs that need protection and other that don't need protection, okay? Like a generic list of, uh, I don't know, uh, 
uh, like uh, all the answers in the example that we have uh, here and during the lecture. I mean, you can list all the answers, that's fine. But when I ask to modify an answer, I should check if it's my answer or somebody else's answer. And the check, uh, I mean, the, the, the API should uh, work uh, uh, only if it's my answer, okay? So I should, you know, check if the rec is authenticated, I can, you know, operate and modify and check also if the request is about something that is uh, mine. So it's uh, the owner of the request is uh, associated with the session. How do I check who is associated with the session? Rec user, okay? That's an additional field in the rec uh, um, uh, object added again by passport that uh, tells um, uh, which user is associated with the uh, uh, authenticated session. Okay? Actually, this is an object. That's the object you decided to put into the session with the previous functions, with the serialized user and so on. Okay? Now, beware. You see this uh, big balloon uh, orange one. This is a major source of errors at the exam, so be careful. Uh, any authenticated request will have a rec user set and rec is authenticated will, will, will return true, okay? But in the body of the request, I need to check that the user is the one that is able, that can operate and do the operation that is doing on the database, okay? Th it's not enough to check the request is authenticated. Every user that has entered a username and password is authenticated, okay? So it returns true here. But inside here, in rec user, I should check the ID of the user to, to see if the user can do the operation or not, okay? Otherwise, I log in, okay, and then I modify the request and I ask for his bank account, okay, if they don't check if the user connected to the authenticated session, it's me and not he or somebody else, okay, uh, you will simply answer with the, with the value and I'm not authorized to see that value, okay. We will come back to this after the break, okay. Um, so last point, logout. Well, logout is the simplest thing, okay? Logout is just a delete API session. It's very easy to implement. You need, don't need to check anything. I don't care if it's authenticated or not. I mean, if it's not authenticated, it doesn't matter. It has no effect, okay? There's no session, no effect. If there's a session, uh, the passport will retrieve the session and will make it invalid rec logout and that's passport that provides this function. We call it, that's all, okay? Everything is automatic. If a cookie has been set, passport retrieves the cookie and checks which, the session, which, which session is associated with that cookie, destroys the session, and that's all, okay? That's a logout. That's the easiest part, okay? Since it's uh, 11.30, let's break for a few minutes, 10 minutes or something more. Okay, and then we'll implement all this stuff in the code, okay? You already have the code, uh, if you, in the break, I know you would like to break, but, uh, you know, the code is already uh, here as usual, okay? In the week uh, 12, uh, yes, okay? And we will work on this code now, after the break. <laughs>